Um, good evening, everyone. Um, 50 odd people here to this evening, so thanks very much for coming along. Um, for those of you that were here last week, um, you'll know that this is the second part of a series of two. For those of, the, of those of you that weren't here last week, what were you doing? Um, how could there have been something better than this? Um, so what's going to happen this evening, um, my name's Callum Sinclair, I'm the project manager of the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative. Um, I'm just going to give a little presentation to set the ball rolling and set the context of what's going to happen. And then we've got other speakers that are going to entertain you for the rest of the, the next hour or so. Um, a little bit of common ground on the project then. The screen will move on for me. Um, just to confirm, we're not expecting any fire drills. So if, the, if you hear a fire alarm, it's in your house. So please uh, get out and tell us about it later. Um, if you drop off the call, um, please just rejoin us using the link provided and uh, Trisha will let you back in and we'll never know you've been gone. Um, we ask that if you're not speaking, you use the mute button and switch off your video. Um, Maybe it's muted centrally, but if not, then can just make sure you're off. Um, we are recording this session, so um, and we'll put that available on our website later on so you can uh, rejoin, rejoin it all over again. And there will be time for questions after each presentation. Um, so there is a chat uh, function at the bottom of the screen Green. So if you just want to ask questions through that chat function, um, we'll be able to pick those up and either answer them as we go along um, and or save some of the bigger ones up that we can um, answer collectively for everyone. So if that's clear, we will just crack on. Um, what's going to happen this evening, um, we've got three presentations um, after this introduction. One is about where you would actually start with native plant control, what you need to know, and uh, talking about a couple of our target species, Japanese knotweed and American skunk cabbage, that's by Mark Thurman Charles, produced on Bayside. Um, and that's then going to be followed by Karen Muller, uh, officer on the Devron, who's going to talk about our approach to Himalayan balsam, giant hogweed and our sheep volunteers. And then I'm going to tie it up by presenting on what we do in the American mink control. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a chance for any questions at the end. Um, for those of you who weren't here last week and who are interested as to what you missed, then this was the programme last week and um, all those presentations are now available on the website at the link above there on the top of the page. So if you, if you are keen to figure out what was, um, what was happening last week because it designed this so that they were sequential, so it's not necessary that you've been to two, but um, certainly we went over some of the sort of uh, groundwork about invasive species last week. Um, very brief about the project in Scottish Invasive Species Initiative is our four-year project due to end in October 2021, but we're likely to extend that for a year to October 2022. It covers a big area of Scotland, about a third of the landmass of the, the, the mainland Scotland, um, and that makes it the biggest invasive species control project in, in certainly in Great Britain. And it's all about engaging with people and in the, in the river environment and in relation to invasive species. There's really three key elements to the project and it's delivered by these partners as we go. So we have funders here, National Lottery Heritage Fund and Nature Scott, which was formerly Scottish Natural Heritage. And with the cash contributions and the in-kind support, the total value of the project is 3.34 million pounds. We are predominantly working alongside rivers and along the riparian edge of rivers, that's the bank sides. Hence the reason that our partnership is predominantly river-based, catchment-based, fishery-based organisations, um, but also the University of Aberdeen, who helped to give us advice, um, particularly on the mink control work. Um, so that is a partnership. It's a bit like herding cats. Um, that's my, my job, um, is to keep this uh, rabble in some sort of order. We have um, three main parts to the, the project. We're going to cover mink control and how we do that in the final presentation this evening. We're going to cover invasive plant control and the practicalities um, via Mark and Karen. Education awareness is something that we, we touched upon a little bit last week, but isn't it really part of the, the programme for this evening? So that really is about all I need to say at the moment. I think it, hopefully that has um, given you a little idea as to what's to come in the next hour. Um, and the first presentation is uh, Mark Perman-Charles. So Mark, if you 
want right, to share okay, your screen, yeah. so I will yeah, yeah. take mine down it's, and go uh, on to It's great to be here. I, uh, I'm sort of following on from some of the Thank stuff you. that, that my in. colleague James was talking about yeah. last week. So we're going to talk a little bit about planning your strategy of controlling invasive non-native plants on a river catchment. But this is broadly applicable to, to most terrains and environments you'd be working in a lot of these a lot of these general principles are, uh, are abroad and, and don't just apply to, to riparian areas and then I'm also going to talk just specifically about Japanese knotweed and American skunk cabbage too so you have invasive plants on your river what do we do well firstly don't panic they're not going anywhere you know they're there now let's let's move forward so firstly understand your species we're going to go into that into a bit more detail then we're going to identify the best control method then we're going to look at understanding the context of the location you're working in and finding the original source then we're going to discuss taking action and then we're also going to look at what you need to do after you've done your control continuing into future years doing monitoring and reviewing and probably more control because a lot of these issues aren't just one year problems and will take a number of years to solve so understanding your species you found a you found a plant on the river you think it's invasive you need to work out what it is because if you don't know what it is you can't control it effectively so you need to understand what it is in terms of how does it spread how does it grow is it an annual is it perennial you know, what time of year is it growing, all these sorts of factors, and then how many years of treatment might be required if it's something that has seeds, how long is the seed bank sitting there, because if you're treating something for three years, and the seed bank seven years, then you're not going to make much of a difference. And then you also have to understand where else is it growing, because just because you found it in your area, it may not be just in your area, it may be elsewhere as well. So you need to identify that, especially if it's something that produces a lots of seeds if it's above you or below you understanding that is important too and we'll go into a bit more detail about that in a minute and then like I say what time of year does it grow if you've got something that grows and flowers and seeds by June if you come along and try and do control in August well you've completely missed your window and you're wasting your time so understanding when you can actually find this thing to deal with the problem before it's already seeded and and you've missed your window that's vital too because then you can look at what's the optimal treatment time and actually get the most bang for your buck and your time and make the most impact and improve the problem much much quicker so it's all about planning in advance of actually going out and doing the control the control is vital but actually making sure you've got all your ducks in the row and you know exactly what you're doing before you even get out on site is incredibly important and i would argue could be more important because if you do it wrong you may well have not done it at all so identifying the most effective control method, we signpost people to the NNSS website. It's the Non-Native Species Secretariat website. It's fantastic. It's got all sorts of information for you on there. Species ID, control methods. You can search for photos. So if you're not sure what something is, you can go on there. There's a huge photo library and, um, and, and you, can, you can get all kinds of fantastic information. There's also contact information, that kind of stuff for various other uh, organizations as well um, the main reason we advise using it obviously is uh, for the control method side of things and there's some things you need to consider when doing control because obviously you might have a budget you might you know you might have a limited number of people so there are things to consider when you're looking at controlling once you've identified the invasive species how you're going to control it firstly what's most effective what time of year is it do you have people available to do control at that time of year if you don't have anyone to actually do the control then it doesn't matter um, and also cost some of these things obviously chemical control a it requires you to purchase kit and chemical but you also need qualifications and those qualifications more often than not are legal requirements if you're doing chemical control so there's a cost associated with that and then also ppe equipment that sort of stuff that that may be you might not have the budget for or you might want to make sure if you are going to spend budget you're spending it on the right thing so you're not buying something that's incorrect and making sure that you're using the right equipment at the right time using the right method is vital because incorrect control can make the problem worse so this is this is this is where you really need to do your research this is absolutely vital so understand your location right you found your species but if you're, say, on the middle of a river catchment, 
it's highly likely that the species might be above you. So you need to find the original source, because if you don't find the original source, you end up in a situation where you're doing control in your localized area. But because the original source is upstream, that will constantly be undermining your effort. So you need to go and actually find this. So what we do is when we when we find a site, we then go upstream to try and find what's actually going on, where it's come from. And usually it's pretty obvious, but sometimes it can be a bit more difficult. And once you've identified that location, more often than not, it's not just an isolated area. If you've got a larger problem that you're dealing with across uh, a catchment or at least a river, um, maybe some burns running into it, which are, which are causing the problem, you then need to start your control work at those uppermost locations. So once you've done all your research in how and when and all that kind of stuff, then you've got to identify where you need to start control and work downstream from there. That seems intuitive, but you'd be amazed how many projects and organizations haven't done this in the past. And we've ended up in a situation where lots of money and time has been poured into control, which ultimately has been futile because they've not actually gone and taken the time to find the upstream source and work with the people in that area, which then ultimately benefits stuff downstream. So what we find, and this is what our project is about, is tra treatment is required on a catchment scale. These are catchment scale problems. And if you don't treat them as such, then you're not going to solve the problem. And that requires partnership working with land managers, landowners, and other organizations. Communication is vital, making sure everyone is on the same page and understands, A, what the issue is and how to deal with it, and then coordinating together. That's what we find is the most important element of this is to make sure everyone knows what's going on. Because if one person isn't doing their, their area, it could end up undermining everyone else's good work, which would be a real shame. So looking at this strategy for control action, here's a nice simple map that we've put together for you guys. And hypothetically, how would, how would we deal with something like this? Well, you've got two species here. One is giant hogweed and one is Japanese knotweed. Now, giant hogweed seeds, whereas Japanese knotweed spreads by rhizome and vegetatively. So if you were to prioritize just a species, you would be looking to deal with the giant hogweed first because ultimately, giant hogweed there, you'd be ultimately more worried about the thing that can produce tens of thousands of seeds a year. As long as Japanese knotweed's left alone, it's not gonna be moving very far. So you don't have to be massively worried about that. So then going on our principles, once we know what time of year we need to do control, where would we start? Well, we wouldn't start down the bottom here where the black is. We wouldn't start where the green is. No, we'd find the upstream source in the catchment, which is the red area here. So once we've done that control, we then will have to carry on downstream. But if we were to get to a tributary like this here, we would have to check up this tributary because if there's hogweed here, we've only really controlled to here because then if we take control to here, that's then being undermined by the hogweed on that tributary. So you have to be really systematic as you work down. And then ultimately you go your reds, your yellow, your green, and then you get to your black. The last thing you want to do is be controlling your black and your green stuff here, because all you're doing is pouring money into something that is going to be reseeded every year from the tributary here and from the higher catchment on the main stem. Now, if you've got enough time in, in both years, to, in, in a year to do both species, fantastic. It also works in our favor that if we did our research, we'd know the optimal control for Japanese knotweed and giant hogweed are at different times of year. So you'd get your, you'd get your giant hogweed out the way in April, May, and June, and then Japanese knotweed control happens in August, September. So that's fantastic. So you've got your seeding main threat out the way, and then you'd move on to your vegetative threat, which... Um, is again, doesn't seed, so it's not quite as nightmarish to deal with. There's no seed bank that you have to be worried about, but you are wanting to deal with it, obviously, correctly. And what you do then is same principle. You wouldn't start down the bottom. You'd go to the top of wherever you found it in your catchment, and you'd work down. It's very, very simple stuff. But like I say, a lot of projects and organizations and landowners don't do this and it requires a bit of coordination with other people around you it, it requires buy-in and partnership work but what we find is when you do this the results can come really really quickly and because you're working as a unit across a catchment you see improvements of biodiversity 
and those outcomes come really, really quickly, which is fantastic. So that's what we want. We don't want to be doing all this work for no tangible outcome. Now, you're doing all this excellent control, but like I said, one year isn't going to solve the issue, especially with something, say, like giant hogweed, which has multiple years of seed bank up to 10 years in some cases it's been so found on some sites so control is important but monitoring your control work and potentially scheduling in follow-up action over successive years is absolutely crucial if you don't say you treat for two or three years on on a on a catchment on a section of river where you've got your problem and then after two or three years you stop because you think you've got it all there's more than likely going to be a seed bank there, or in the case of Japanese knotweed, the rhizome might not be completely killed off. You leave it for a year or two, you come back, and then suddenly it's right back to where you started. So the control has to be complemented by constant monitoring review on an annual basis. And what you'll find is your workload drops year on year as the situation improves, so you have to allocate less time. But it is vital to make sure that in the case of something that's got a seed bank, the seed bank is exhausted, and in the case of something like Japanese knotweed with rhizomes, that all those energy sources are depleted and you're not getting shoots coming back. So this is absolutely vital. And don't be fooled by the visual element improving quickly because appearances can be deceiving and they often are deceiving. And that's where the mistakes happen. I've worked on sites where I've been told by the land manager, oh, yeah, we knocked that out years ago. And that immediately worries me. And more often than not, I go to the site, I have a look. And it's been treated incorrectly for too short a period of time. And actually, the problem's still there. And in some cases, it's worse than when they even started. So this is the really vital bit here. Because um, if you don't do this bit correctly, all your good work of identifying when, where, how, and then actively doing it is for nothing. So this is, this is, this is the really important bit. Now, looking at some species we deal with quickly. So Japanese knotweed is a very common one we see across our riparian areas, but we also see it in wasteland, railways, urban areas, roadsides. It does well in disturbed areas, disturbed ground. Introduced from Japan and East Asia, it's been escaping for, for a long time now. And like I said, it spreads by rhizomes and plant fragments. It's not able to seed in the UK, which works in our favor. So that we, we can use that to our advantage. The impacts, it outcompetes native species. It exacerbates erosion because it just absolutely destroys anything else in the area. And then when it dies back, you get bare banks, which when a spate comes along, it just washes the, uh, the embankment away. And the rhizomes can also damage foundations and pavements in urban areas. And then there's obviously a significant economic impact of having to deal with the problem. And then in many cases, having to rehabilitate the, the ecosystem or the environment of where this stuff has got and escaped in. Control methods. Very, very simple. We say go for stem injection. That's the best way. You're not spreading chemical around. You've got your lovely stem injector here. Here we can see James injecting into a stem. That sticks the chemical straight into the plant. That's then absorbed into the rhizome, which present, prevents, um, prevents the plant from absorbing any more nutrients and slowly kills off the rhizome over a year or two. Optimal treatment is July to September, but we, I tend to leave it till August if possible. So August, September, I would say is, is the absolute best. But if you, if you need more time, you can start in July as well. Um, we look to inject about 60% of the stems. And obviously you want to mark those stems when you've injected them, because if you're in a field of hogweed, you start to forget what you've injected very, very quickly. Um, this is very targeted and effective. Like I've said, I've seen sites we've treated where we've had maybe a 90 to 95% improvement if with just one year of treatment if we've gotten over 60% of the stems. But like I said, it is vital to go back in consecutive years and do follow-up sweeps just to make extra sure, repeating year on year, that you are completely eradicating the problem and you're not getting rid of 90% of it just to go back in a couple of years' time and it's recovered from the, the, the excellent work you've done. There are other control methods. Spraying is an option. Um, it, uh, we use it as follow-up treatment in follow-up years. I try not to do it the first year because I find stem injection is the most effective, but they will get to a point where the plants are so small that you can't stem inject them anyway. Um, it is cheaper and quicker. So if cost is an issue, it is something to consider where you're not using neat chemical, you're using diluted chemical instead. 
um, but it is less targeted and you will spread more chemical into the environment. So that is something to consider if, say, you're working in a vulnerable or, or a triple SI site or something like that. Now, manual control. Never, ever, 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 ever do manual control. Do not cut, do not strim, do not mow. Even the tiniest plant fragment will cause this to spread. And the main reason we've seen Japanese rock knotweed spread on the River Tay, which is the river I cover, I would say 80% of the reason it's spread is through overenthusiastic gillies not understanding what they're dealing with. The ambition is there to do the right thing, but unfortunately they've strimmed it and just made the problem even worse. Here's the stems we've injected over the last couple of years. As you can see, we're cracking through a huge number and it's all down to our fantastic volunteers there on the right. Uh, we work with a wide range of people and we're seeing some really good improvements on, on our, our, all across our project area due to this volunteer activity. And here's just some quick examples. So on, on the left, we've got a site at Dunkeld. We used 32 hours and seven liters of herbicide. Following year, we only needed two hours and 0.4 liters of herbicide. On the other side, six hours and three liters, and then zero the following year. And super quickly, American skunk cabbage introduced from North America. It spreads both by seed and rhizome, grows in swampy, muddy areas, and it's quite distinctive visually and has a very strong smell. Uh, shades out native plants, outcompetes them, all this sort of stuff. Uh, the blood and the rhizomes can block drainage in ditches and watercourses, and, and it's just generally a nuisance plant that will then degrade your biodiversity. Uh, the most effective method is foliar spray. You can't stem inject it. Uh, obviously, glyphosate again, ensure you're using proper dosage. You can get that information. There are specific fact sheets on um, these species. So you can actually go and find the right dosage specifically for these species, they are available. Um, optimal treatment we find is May and July, May to July rather, before it seeds, because obviously if you spray it after it seeds, then you've missed your window and you may as well have not done any control because it's been able to reproduce. So make sure you get in before it seeds and multiple, multiple follow-up years are required. You can do digging, but it's a nightmare because even a tiny fragment of the rhizome root, if you leave that in there, it will just regrow. And if you spread little fragments around, they will become new plants. If you're pushed for time and you can't do any form of control other than cutting off the seed heads before they seed, that's still useful because at least the situation is not getting any worse. It's not going to get much better, but at least it's not going to get any worse. So that's fantastic. And they only flower after three years. So if you can get control in before year three, then you're, not, you're going to be in a situation where there's no seed bank, which would be fantastic. This is a site we've been working on in Pit Lockery. As you can see in 2019, it was quite a bad issue. The, the burn itself was completely choked and the pond area was completely choked. We had to take about 16 hours in this area and used about three litres of, of herbicide neat, which was obviously then diluted because we were spraying it. Um, and then fast forward to 2020, as you can see from the photos, the dominance is right, right down, which is fantastic. It took 10 hours of control because it was difficult terrain, but the, the herbicide usage came right down. And what we're seeing is a much healthier ecosystem environment. And um, we're also seeing really good improvement in terms of the amount of coverage. We've gone from very, very dense coverage to almost minimal coverage, rare, almost nothing there. So this is the thing. If you're consistent we will need to follow up here because there is a seed bank but early control is working nicely for us and we'll be going back and hopefully solving the situation completely so there's a quick rundown of doing some overall control work how to how to approach it some general pointers and then some specific information on those two species and i think we've got a quick uh question and answer if anyone's uh, got any questions i think is is that right callum yeah, I was just going to suggest if you take your slides down, Mark, yeah, great. We're pretty much on time. I thought for a minute we were going to have Mark <laughs> have an hour performance for us today, but it quickened up the pace second half. I got um, that. Thanks very much for that. We've not actually got any questions come through yet, either on the chat. No worries. Um, if anyone wants to put someone in, then please do so. Um, I think the, the main message is for, for us for Mark's presentation is that giving yourself a bit of breathing space and thinking time before you start is, is going to um, 
it's going to it's going to save you a lot of grief later on. And Mark mentioned it, but the, the Scotland and the world is littered with invasive control projects that have just basically started in the, at the wrong place, and people get frustrated because they don't solve the problem. So I think you know drawing breath and making a plan is really the key thing. And we've now got a flurry of questions coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Let's I'll make a restart on some of these. Um, first one, Mark, maybe one for you. How long does skunk cabbage live? Uh, that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, it's it a specific plant can live multiple years and it can have multiple seeding um, seasons as well. I don't know if there's any particular number of years, but it obviously takes three years before it can seed and then it can do a couple of years of seeding. Um, so it's it's one of those ones that can hang around for a very long time and obviously it builds up cumulatively the more it seeds and then you get more and more plants. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. That once they could become established, they seed and they sort of continue to expand and develop. And, and yeah, and, um, they're an ornamental um, specimen species, so you don't you usually see one or two in an ornamental garden, and they'll have been there for for, mm. for years and years. Yeah, yeah. We've got a couple of questions on um, glyphosate, so maybe yep. maybe pick that one up because we we always get asked that. Um, is glyphosate going to be banned soon? Well. Not as far as we know. Um, obviously, a number of people have heard of the legal cases in states where people have um, um, you know, lit litigated um, against um, uh, cancer um, diagnoses and related that to the use of glyphosate. Um, at the minute, in the Britain and the EU, glyphosate remains legal for use, and um, and we take take all these cases seriously. But I think the situations are very different, and um, you know, we're properly using it following the, the manufacturer's recommendations and using PPE. And I think the other issue is there is no robust alternative in terms of chemical approach to glyphosate as things stand. So, you know, I think there's going to be a massive hole in the control tactics where glyphosate go. And I see Rebecca's asked a question, Rebecca Lewis, about alternative methods other than chemical. Um, so we've, we will touch on a couple of potential alternative methods. It's really a species by species issue that. Um, so Matt was pretty bold in his, um, you know, um, plea not to not to uh, attack Japanese not with a swimmer or, or physical yeah. control, control. So that will absolutely make the problem much worse for that. Um, but there are other species where um, some of the species Karen's going to talk about where alternatives are available, you know, including strimming and cutting yeah. or digging them out. But often the non-chemical methods are very um, labour intensive um, and not often effective because we've got these fragments of plants that can cause um, problems thereafter. Um, does the herbicide affect native plants? I don't know. You could take that one, Mark. That's from well, the... yeah. I mean, if you're if you're being targeted, so if you're injecting straight into, say, a Japanese knotweed stem, no, because that's going straight into the plant and then down into the rhizome. If you're doing foliar spray, we tend to use cowls. So and the correct nozzle which means we're very targeted and we're spot treating the invasive plants that we're looking for and we're avoiding spread into the other uh plant mixtures native hopefully plant mixtures that we're that we're working in but you will get a certain amount of um of of drift which will which will hit native plants but if you're doing it correctly you can keep that to being virtually negligible yeah and that's why the applicant, the applicant needs to be qualified, and that's, that's, part yeah. of training, that's part of the training, so that you don't do minimise exactly. the impact to other plants. A couple of really quick ones, Mark, and I'll maybe pick up some of the questions in the chat box once yep. Karen starts. Um, how do you dispose of the dead plants after treatment? Um, so, with chemical control, Japanese knotweed and American skunk cabbage, they'll just rot, rot essentially, because what it's a systemic chemical. So, what it does is it stops the plant from absorbing new nutrients. And the plant basically starves itself and and decomposes over time as it as it dies essentially. So you don't need to dispose them. Yeah, and then a, a quick final one I think for this this session from Alistair McKechnie with Japanese knotweed. Do they inject into the stem wall or into the hollow? Uh, yeah, so the Japanese knotweed stem is is essentially it's, it's hollow. It's like bamboo. So what you've got is you've got your stem injector with a needle. You get that needle into the actual hollow area. And you go all the way through the stem wall into that hollow area and then you inject down into that hollow area and it's sort of in sections you get it in there and that will then be absorbed 
um, through through the through the stem itself into the rhizome. Excellent. Okay, um, we've now got to half past seven. So what I'm going to suggest is I'll try and answer some of these questions in the chat box as the next presentation is going on. So I'm just going to invite Karen Muller to take the floor. Um, Karen's based with the River Peverin, and she's going to give us a, a little go down on another couple of our target species and their wonderful feet. Karen, the floor is yours. Karen. All right, well, I'm going to talk about Himalayan balsam today, giant hogweed, and then our sheep grazing trial for giant hogweed. So diving right in with Himalayan balsam, um, really pretty flower um, that was introduced in 1839 and then mainly spread because people were passing seeds to each other. Um, it does spread by seeds um, and it tends to grow on, on riverbanks where we're dealing with it or damp woodland. So, so damp areas are um, a preferred place for it to grow. Um, you can find out a little bit more on our website, um, in our ID guide, if you're interested and you'll find lots of pictures there as well. So you're probably starting to see a bit of a pattern here with these invasive species, as in um, their impact on our native species by crowding and outcompeting them. Um, this one in particular is one that produces a lot of nectar and is really attractive to pollinators, but that unfortunately often means that our native plants are kind of left unpollinated, um, which then obviously exacerbates that cycle. Um, a really shallow root system that uh, can really promote that erosion of riverbanks when it dies back in the winter. Um, and it has a seed viability of around two years. What can we do about it? Um, what we mostly do, and this is a great one because it doesn't take any specialized equipment and it doesn't take any, any particular skills, it can be done by um, any volunteer in any age group from primary school kids to people in retirement um, is hand pulling. So we're making use of that shallow root system to just pull the plant up by the roots. Um, you can pile it up like you can see in this little picture here um, that just makes sure that these plants won't reroot um, and will just die and degrade on site. Um, you've got quite a nice long treatment period as well from April to July where you can be doing that. The other option is that you could do mechanical control, so strimming, scything, or slashing. It's a great one because if you've got monocultures of Himalayan balls, which you know, later will form, um, this is really time effective. Um, but something to keep in mind is that it's also a lot less selective um, if the balsam is still mixed in with other vegetation. So judge what your best approach is based on what your site looks like. Something to keep in mind for Himalayan balsam is that it grows a bit like Japanese knotweed or like bamboo and nodes up the stem, and these stems can actually reroot into the ground. So when we are pulling it up, we want to make sure that we actually get it out by the root. We don't just snap off the stem somewhere. And when we are cutting it, it's the same sort of thing. We want to cut it as low to the ground as possible, if at all possible, below the first node. Um, because what I've circled here is that stubborn regrowth that the plant will do if we get it um, any higher than that or if we just snap it off. The other thing that we want to make sure is that we carry out control before seed pods form. So if you watch the hand here that I've circled, these are seed pods once they have ripened. Um, and when they have ripened, the slightest touch will mean that these seeds will scatter from the seed pods, like you can see here, um, up to seven meters. And that is how the plant spreads so successfully. Um, I'm just going to play that again. Watch the hand. Um, they can float as well. So spreading down the river in all directions um, is not a problem for this plant. Obviously, Himalayan balsam doesn't quite um, keep to our timelines. So quite often you will find that you might be controlling areas where um, predominantly it's still all flowering plants, but some will have gone to seed. Um, if you are controlling these areas, then just make sure that you brush off your clothing, you clean under your shoes before you leave that site so that we're not actually making this problem any worse or carrying seeds to new areas that are unaffected at this point. Here are some really impressive stats for over the last three years of our project working with volunteers on um, balsam pulling days. So in 2018, across our project area, we started off with a really respectful 120 days of pulling with volunteers. Um, we ramped that right up in 2019 to 286 days of pulling with volunteers. Um, and then obviously COVID-19 threw a spanner in the works in 2020. But volunteers still fantastically came out with us to pull for 43 days. Um, and this is a great activity because 
it means that people can still get out um, safely. We can absolutely socially be socially distanced on the riverbank, um, but you still get to be outside. You still get to be with people and do something good for nature. Um, and I think that will have helped a lot of people with their mental health, especially last year. So huge thank you as always to our volunteers for that. And a nice little progress story here on the River Yugi, which is one of the catchments that I'm covering. So as you can see in the top pictures here in 2019, um, me and the landowner were pulling the stretch um, and hacking away at it because you can see there's quite a bit of a pink hue everywhere. Um, so we spent eight hours hacking away at Himalayan balsam and pulling selectively at times. Um, and then really impressively when we came back in 2020, which are the bottom pictures, um, it looks much improved. Um, you can barely see any pink at all. We spent three hours still just selectively pulling balsam out, but it was looking so much better. So a really nice little progress story where we can actually maybe make a difference. Um, and the seed viability of only two years can make a huge difference here. The next species I'm covering is giant hogweed, which is probably one that you have all heard about um, and maybe seen. Uh, it's not really um, a big question why it was introduced as a curiosity. My volunteer in this picture here is about six foot tall, so that gives you a pretty good idea of the scale of the plant he's standing next to. Um, it spreads by prolific seed production, um, 20 to 30,000 seeds per plant, um, and it grows by rivers, uh, which is where we're mostly finding it, but also in rough pastures and in wasteland. The one big thing to watch with it is the phototoxic sap. So the sap of this plant uh, causes skin burns when it reacts with direct sunlight. Um, so certainly a wide, wide berth you should be making around this plant. The pattern is here again, forming really dense stands. You can see the big leaves down here that pretty much just shade out everything and crowd out everything. Um, you've got those, those human health impacts from the phototoxic sap. Um, and then certainly that has an impact on how we use our water courses. Because if you're confronted with a big wall of giant hogweed, chances are you're not gonna be frolicking along the river that day or any other day in the next coming years. The plant does take about three to five years to actually get to a flowering um, stage. They will store up energy in the taproot uh, year on year until they've got enough stored up that they will actually be able to put out uh, um, the big flower. So you've got a little bit of time when it comes to control. So our most effective and our safest method of control um, for us is spraying the leaves with glyphosate. Um, you've got from about April till June to do that really effectively, but again, keeping in mind you need qualifications for that. You're spraying in and near water, um, and obviously you need the right PPE, um, especially if you're going close to these plants and this sap. The other options. Um, are two more which also use herbicide. So um, you can stem wipe, which is the first stem inject, which is uh, this picture here, where just like Japanese knotweed, you inject a neat dose of herbicide directly into the hollow stem, or you can weed wipe, where you're just applying a little bit of neat herbicide onto the leaves. You just wipe it on and it will absorb it. These methods can be really effective for areas where there's only limited amount of plants. Um, so maybe you don't want to be wearing a, a 15 litre knapsack over the eight kilometres of riverbank when you're only actually finding 15 plants. Um, but again, you need qualifications for this and these methods do require you to get a lot closer to these plants. So you want to make sure that you are definitely wearing the right PPE, you want to have the right training and um, you, want to want, you just want to use these in those circumstances where actually this is a better idea than spraying. Otherwise, spraying is always going to be the number one. And then when M has grown legs and is running, um, you will quite often find that at some point during a peak treatment period, some of these plants will have reached the stage where they're actually going to flower. Um, so a huge priority for us is to actually remove these flowering heads so that we're preventing any seeds from setting. So I've got a little video of Jack here showing us how it's done. So he takes the flower head off and then uses his long pole saw so he doesn't have to get too close to saw that down. And then we usually combine that with um, adding a little bit of herbicide into the hollow stem so that uh, this plant won't come back. That will still be absorbed by the, by the cut stem and will be transported into the root um, and then that will be that flowering plant dead. 
um, like I said, really, really important because we don't want to be setting any seeds. Um, so certainly something come sort of July, um, a long pole saw should be something that is in your repertoire that you're taking with you out when you're battling giant hogweed. Um, digging is an option. Digging, I would only suggest for small plants and sporadic plants, um, but it very much depends on how much of a glutton for punishment you are. It depends on the ground conditions. Um, and it is it is a huge path. Um, so certainly in areas where maybe herbicide really can't be used or where you've only got um, a very few plants, um, this can be an option, but I would generally say it's not a preferred option. So again, just to sum that up, priority absolutely preventing any seeding, so removing flower heads. Um, I would happily at this point when there is flowering plants around, I would happily walk around um, any of the giant hogweed plants that won't be flowering that year, you can get them next year um, and just concentrate on all the big white flowering heads um, and preventing that seeding. And as always, practice good biosecurity, make sure you brush yourself off under your shoes, brush your car off if needs be, um, just make sure that you're not carrying these seeds elsewhere. Seed viability is three years at least, probably longer for some of them, so you really don't want to be spreading that problem. Which brings us to some impressive stats once again across our project area over the last three years. Um, so in 2018, we are here looking at um, kilometers of riverbank that are under management for a giant hogweed across our project area. So in 2018, that was 639 kilometers of riverbank. We ramped that up in 2019 to 760, which is an equivalent distance from London to Inverness in a straight line, just so you can visualize that and actually how impressive that is. Um, and then in 2020, actually, we didn't take a massive hit with COVID-19 because even though us project officers were in home office and we weren't able to go out, and even when we got out in June, we were only able to work with a limited number of volunteers. Um, all of our land managers really stepped it up that year. They were on site anyway, they could safely do it, and they really stepped it up and, and hit it hard um, during the time when we couldn't. So actually, we didn't take a big hit at all with 753 kilometers under management in 2020. So a huge thank you once again there. And we really couldn't be doing it without the help. And to sum that up, a nice little progress story. This is Ingalls Maldi, where in 2019, we found this lovely monoculture of giant hogweed, spent 20 hours controlling that. Um, we had to spray seven liters of neat herbicide, obviously diluted on the site. Um, and then in 2020, the story looks much different. So we actually only had to spend eight hours controlling this and only used 0.7 liters of, of herbicide. Um, but something to keep in mind here and to take with a grain of salt, obviously, is that the seed bank is existing there the seed viability is relatively long. So um, we're not expecting this to necessarily look like this in 2021, because what we've actually also done here is when you look at the bottom pictures is we've really nicely prepared that ground for seed germination. So it's not gonna be unexpected that this might actually go up a little bit again, um, but we're hoping at least it will plateau at some point um, and we're not using as much herbicide as we did initially. And then also, um, that we can use that extra time that we're maybe not spending on this site in other areas. And that brings me to flocking to the rescue, our lovely flock of sheep that we're using in the Dever and catchment um, that are helping us graze this giant hogweed down. So the idea behind this is to, to answer the basic question, can land managers use sheep to control giant hogweed? So what we want to do is we want to we want to establish the optimal grazing regime um, and we want to produce a guidance document at the end of our trial in 2021. If you want to read a little bit more in depth about this, um, if you head to our website, there's our case study that will be updated regularly every year. And you will also find some really nice um, trail camera footage of sheep grazing giant hogweed there. So I can only recommend that. So just to introduce the site very briefly, um, this sheep grazing trial was established in 2019. Um, we are working in a mature woodland strip that is sort of wedged in between the River Deverin and some arable land. And there's a number of streams running through that woodland and draining into the Deverin. 
Um, so quite nice, damp conditions, everything that Hogweed likes. Um, there is a walking path through the site, so obviously that introduces public health concerns. Um, and we have this very impressive giant hogweed infestation, um, where you can see an example here in the picture. The previous chemical control that was carried out on that site was actually ineffective, it was time consuming, it was expensive, and uh, the farmer was actually really, really keen to give this a shot with the sheep. And so enter the humble sheep. So this is obviously a multi-year process. Like I said, the, the, the plant will take a few years to flower, it stores up energy. So there is a seed bank already existing. So the sheep will continuously work year on year on the site to try and deplete these energies of the, of the hogweed that's already existing there and mow down any seedlings that are coming up from a seed bank. So really important that we monitor our progress because of that. So for that, we're working with the University of Aberdeen and we're looking at grazing impact on the volume of giant hogweed and we're looking at grazing impact on the rest of the vegetation. So you can see some of our monitoring spots in our site up here. And I've put a nice little example in here of the progress that the sheep have been made um, in 2019 and 2020. So if we're just looking at what it looked like in June 2019, where there was lots and lots of hogweed compared to how that looks like after the sheep had been on site the same year, how that looks in June 2020, which looks much better already, even though there is lots of seedlings coming through, um, and then how that looks in September 2020, already a massive difference. So what have we learned so far? What we've learned is that in 2019, we started off with over 5,000 sheep grazing days in total, and we found that the sheep were tackling giant hogweed really effectively, but they were also overgrazing the other vegetation quite a lot. So in 2020, we cut these sheep grazing days in half and found that sheep were still tackling giant hogweed really effectively. Um, and they were causing less overgrazing, but some was still happening. Um, so this year, we're actually aiming for just around about um, 1,500 sheep grazing days. Um, to see what that will do to the overgrazing part of it and how effectively they're still tackling the giant hogweed. Um, but the takeaway message so far is that even with decreased sheep grazing, um, the, hog the hogweed is still effectively tackled, um, but we're hoping to really avoid overgrazing entirely. Because what we're finding with that is that overgrazing actually alters vegetation structure and composition of these other vegetation communities long term. Um, so we need to try and find that balance between effectively tackling giant hogweed, um, but also conserving that vegetation community that we actually want and that's native on the site. So initial undergrazing, much preferable to overgrazing. We can always adjust that to make that work. Um, and of course, it does take a little bit of manual mop up from us every year of checking up because if there is big plants that are still going to flower um, and the sheep haven't, um, sort of what we've observed, knock them over and graze them down, then we will need to cut them just to prevent any seeds from setting because we don't want to make this problem any worse. We want to work over the years to make this problem better. Um, and that is the big takeaway message so far from us. But like I said, go to our website, have a look at the case study and at some of the trail cam footage, um, and we will be updating that. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions if there is any. Okay, Karen, thank you. Um, we've had a two or three questions have come through as we've gone about toxicity of um, hogweed, which we've tried to answer as we go. So I'm just going to pick up on a couple of questions that have come in just at the last one. Everyone's always concerned about the welfare of the sheep, which is lovely to hear, and it happens every time we talk about this. Um, there's a question there about, is it, does it need to be a specific breed of sheep, or is there anyone that um, we are find is working? So um, there was actually a different trial that was running um, from 2013 in the Devon catchment as well. And those sheep, we, we started using black-faced sheep just because we figured with the toxicity of the sap that a probably hairier breed with darker pigmentation might be the better idea. And they actually had extensive vet care, especially in the beginning, to be checked up to make sure that there wasn't any ill effects. And actually, so far in none of our trials, we have found any ill effects. And we are now using um, not only black-faced sheep, and we have been doing that without any issues. Yeah, we, we certainly mindful of that that welfare issue, but sheep at the end of their grazers, and they seem to be very happy to graze the hogweed. Um, 
Karen, there's another one there which might apply for you. It's about replanting plans. You know, once we've successfully removed invasives or something of space left behind, have we got any thoughts on how do we know what to what to replant in the place and when do we do it? That's a difficult one because if you so for Himalayan Bolton, that might actually be an option. But um, once you've gone away from maybe streaming or scything monocultures, we're, we're hoping that native vegetation will actually move back in. Um, something else that we have started thinking about last year, just as a little trial, is to actually collect some native seeds from the site, dry them out over the winter and maybe um, plant those on, on areas. But with anything else, anything that has um, a longer seed viability like giant hogweed, it's a really difficult one because chances are you're going to be planting some native vegetation per chance and then seedlings will come back through and they will outcompete that and then you're going to be back on that area spraying um, and inevitably you're going to be spraying some of these native plants that you will have planted as well so that's a really difficult one at some point down the line probably a good idea in the first few years of treatment depends on the site I think but means a lot of this does fall into this depends on the site thing and it depends what you're trying to replace. So in some instances, um, you know, we've used native decid deciduous tree plantings in some riverine uh, riparian areas, and you can get sort of um suitable wild 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 plant mixes and wild flower mixes that we, we have considered and have used on very limited occasions. But I think that often the the change from invasives to natural fauna or flora rather is quite gradual. So we can actually see recolonization of the native species as we see the, the reduction in the invasive species. Um, and we've also got Mark's comment on the, the, the chat box as well about native grass methods. So we, we, all those things are possible. Um, and maybe I'm going to just take one maybe more question. Um, it's, it's about would other livestock, ponies, cattle, goats be possible grazers? I think the actual easy answer to that is yes, they would. Um, you know, there's a number of different animals will graze um, species such as hogweed um, and, and are known to do so. And the reason we've landed on sheep within the trial is that um, there's a lot of sheep in Scotland and we're trying to find, if you like, a, a management um, advice that might have some utility in a, in a wider context. So that's where we're working to um, at the moment. So um, keep the questions coming in. And then um, we'll try and do our best, but at the minute I'm going to need to busk it and do my presentation at the same time as um, so maybe store them in questions, unless Karen or, or Matt want to pick them up as we go. And um, so I'm just going to try and share my screen and uh, thank Karen for her presentation there. And um, okay, so what I'm going to try and do in the next um, less than 15 minutes, if I can, is talk through our approach to controlling American mink. Um, American mink is a, as a Effect predator. Um, it's the only animal in our hit list most of the time in the other presentations you've heard have been about our approach to plant control. Um, minks are different kettle of fish altogether. Um, it's a predator, it impacts on native um, animals and fauna, particularly water voles and ground nesting birds, which are vulnerable to the mink um, because they, the nests are accessible and then um, the, the breeding locations of the water voles are accessible also. Mink also is generally widespread but at a low population density so you're not going to go into one place and knock over tens and tens and tens of animals and solve your problem they are low density but widespread and they're fantastic colonizers they move large distances to find places and then um, locations to breed and they're also resilient to control so the harder you try to remove them they respond by breeding more effectively and um, in larger number so it, it's a it's an ongoing challenge this this animal and it's one that we have been working on for quite a number of years in this project and others um meet the mink um this is sort of a um, potted history of of what the animal is about it's a mustelid semi-aquatic carnivore which means it's happy in the water and out of the water for those that haven't seen one before 30 to 45 centimeters long and tail about half again um Often that's a dark brown colour and sometimes with a little white bib just underneath the underneath the chin and you get a different range of colours from this quite dark one to sort of uh, much more brownish. Um, hunts mostly by sight, but it can hear 
squeaks and squeals of, of rodents and then um, use a target. It smells. If you've had the misfortune to be close enough to one, then you'll probably realise it's a good idea not to be close to one. Um, and they're territorial. Female territories are, are smaller and then one, three kilometres than males, up to six kilometres. Average four young per year, maximum 16. So, you know, it, it can be very effective in its reproduction. And we were asked this, I think, in a presentation the other day, which is why I've added it. Um, predators in America, um, there's a sort of a wild and woolly list here of coyotes, wolves, bears, great horned owls, and bobcats. And as far as we know, there's not too many of them bounding around um, Scotland or Britain. But um, that's part of the reason it's so successful, because it doesn't have um, natural predators in, in the places that it lives now in the UK. Um, and it's got here because we brought it here. Um, fur farms in the UK and Scotland, you know, the early part of the 20th century, um, and fur farming ceased operation in Scotland in, in the late part of the 20th century, 1993 and was banned totally in Wales and England in 2000 and in Scotland in 2002. But you can see from these maps that from a distribution which was quite limited and really targeted along the areas where fur farms were located in 67, spread was um, pretty incessant and got animals across the large part of the Scottish mainland. And spread continued after the, 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 the mink farms had gone. So it's a problem that we've introduced and it's a problem that, that has remained after we've um, stopped the, the activity that initially brought the problem to us. So it is a, is a challenge. Um, so what sort of problems can they cause? Well, they, they do eat fish, um, hence this one with the little um, nifty little brown trout. But the reality of it is they probably don't have a huge impact on fish populations per se. There's a lot of fish generally in our rivers and the numbers that they will eat at the density of those animals um, doesn't really impact on fish populations, but clearly they can make a difference. Um, and but we can see a little bit more significant damage there to um, a seabird colony and the, the poor little water bowl um, hiding away in the reeds in the top left. And when you look at the the graph on the left hand side here, you can see the massive decline to the UK water bowl population from the 60s right up to the early part of the 21st century, and that was been pretty squarely put at the feet of the American mink. If you remember those two maps, the, that decline pretty much matches the expansion, the distribution of American mink in the UK. So therefore, um, they are public enemy number one to water voles. And also what we find is when we remove mink, we can see a rebound locally of the water vole population. Um, we mentioned that these animals are mobile and it's some, sometimes just worth remembering how mobile they are. This map on the right, was work that we did a number of years ago, and it's a genetic piece of work, a genetic study. And what these joined up lines are, are, are animals that were captured and removed, but which are genetically related. And what we see here is that these animals travel long distances. Um, once, they, once they've um, been reared and by, the, by the mother, they then move a long way to find new territories. Um, an average rate of 20 kilometers to find somewhere new to be, but 20% of these animals will move greater than 80 kilometres. And this map is showing, you know, the migration from Tayside north into the northeast of Scotland and then beyond into Inverness and Murray, etc. So they move around a lot. And that means that um, mink are everyone's problem over quite a big area. If you target your control too locally, the animals will just simply be um, recolonised. There are two main periods when we catch these animals. One is about now, um, the springtime, as the animals are um, moving into breeding territories and, and starting breeding activity. And then they sort of um, lie low for a period, uh, May, June, and, and July, before they re emerge with the young and the, the young disperse. So there are two key periods for us to catch these animals. One is the early part of the spring, and one is again July, August, September, when the young of the year are out and about and moving around. And we can see that pattern replicated in each of the years that we've been doing control. So how do we do this? Um, we mentioned a couple of times the, the work of volunteers and you know, I would just like to re-emphasize that this does not happen without the, the input of hundreds of people. And for those that are familiar with this, apologies, but those are not, it's a very simplistic approach. 
Um, the young lady on the left um, is monitoring a mink rack for us. A mink rack is nothing much more complicated than a, a small table size float, which we tie and tether to the side of the river. And underneath that tunnel, there's a little clay pad. And the mink is a nosy little critter. And when it goes under the tunnel, it leaves its telltale footprint on the clay, the middle picture. And that tells us that they're in the area. And when we detect those footprints, we then take the tunnel off, put a trap underneath it and reset it. And uh, that means that we are not having to run traps in locations where there are no mink around. And the reason for that is that when you set uh, any trap such as this to capture wild animals, you've got to check that trap at least once every 24 hours. And that's a very big burden of, of effort for a volunteer to do if there's no animals anywhere near it. So um, the monitoring is really important because it triggers the trapping expertise. And, I, and this is a volunteer from Tayside who's been with us for a number of years, Ali, and a somewhat unfortunate little mink who's about to be his demise. The trap on the right has um, what we call a mink police unit attached. And we use this in very remote locations to allow us to monitor the trap while we, where we perhaps do not have a volunteer or where the distance to, to reach the trap every day is, is large. And that sends an automatic notification when the trap is closed and we can then attend. And that, uh, uh, that's legally a legally competent approach to, to monitoring the trap every 24 hours. And we use live capture traps um, so that we can let the good guys away. Um, this trap is, there are other animals that take an interest in these. Um, Whole cat bottom left, uh, a little albino ferret middle, uh, pine marten top right, and a little otter has managed to snuggle its way in there bottom right. The mink in the picture is the, the, the little guy in the middle bottom cage. But by using the live capture traps, we can release non target species without damage and harm, and uh, we can deal with the, the mink that we're targeting. So, how do we approach this? Scotland's a big place. We are targeting a third of Scotland in our efforts. So we need to think what the mink does and how it behaves and what it likes. And mink are generally not mountainous uh, creatures. So we're not going to find them in the top of end there. Is. They're not particularly enthused by bogs and wetlands and, and peatlands. So they're less likely to be found there. But they are absolutely delighted to be along coastal fringes where there's lots of food supply, birds, shellfish, uh, fish, and often in uh, uh, agricultural land and improved agricultural land. And you can match up those sort of habitats on that map to the right by, in the broad scale of things, the green areas are areas that are kind of low-lying, often coastal, agricultural, and the, the sort of a uh, sort of orangey grey colour is the sort of mountainous parts of the interior of Scotland that we tend to find less animals there. So using those sort of, that sort of knowledge about where we prefer to be, um, we then set our network. So this is the draft of that network 2018 to 19. Um, maximum number of traps there, 345. Maximum number of rafts, 428. And it changes a little bit by year. Um, but you can see that that network is really maintained by hundreds of volunteers um, going up each year um, since we started this work in 2018 and allows us to have a reasonably good coverage across the project area but you'll note also particularly targeted on those coastal and agricultural areas and then running up catchments between and less active in the mountainous areas um, of the, the Cairngorms and the Grafis. So where do we catch them? Um, well, we catch them in these places. We have approximately five or 600 trap or raft locations, but our capture sites are much fewer in number. There's 172 different capture locations, 2018 to 2020, and a total number of animals removed are 368. So again, these are not animals that appear in huge numbers in particular locations, but some locations are better than others. And what this shows us that of that extensive network, uh, five or 600, locations, at least two thirds of those have never caught, never caught a mink. Um, but they re remain really, really important to us because it helps to, to check that those, mink, those areas are mink free and also detect when animals are migrating in and hopefully we can pick them off before they become established in new areas. 
So that's just a general distribution of the captured sites, but not all sites are equal. And we have a number of hotspots that we are finding out about and aware of. So this first image is the, shows the capture locations where we have caught a single animal. Uh, 94 of these sort of locations, um, giving, not surprisingly, 94 mink, 25% um, of our total. But when we look a little bit further into this, we begin to identify hotter locations, if you like. So here are the sites where we've had two to four animals. Again, a smaller number, 59 of these, but capturing 41% of the total animals. Um, so again, you'll see them, catchments, agricultural areas, coastal fringes. But actually, if you go even further and say, well, here are the sites where we're catching more than five mink. And there's very, very few of those. And again, they match up coastal sites, um, sometimes in their catchment areas and on agricultural ground. And there's very few of these, 19 in fact. So 11% of the capture locations give us 34% of the total mink. And if you think back a little bit further, of these approximately 600 raft or trap locations and 368 captures, 78 only of these locations account for 75% of the total mink removed. So we really need to know, and we do now know where these, link, these mink prefer to be, where they reproduce effectively, and where they want to migrate to, the prime habitat areas, and therefore we target those and target them hard. And we've said a couple of times, but we really could not do this work without the network of volunteers. So this is just a slide of numbers, but I think the most important one is the bottom right, um, 50,000, more than 50,000 volunteer hours um, across the duration of the project, which is a massive effort. Um, but these are coming in very small units. Um, my granny would say, many a, a mickle makes a muckle. And these are volunteers that are maybe putting in 15 minutes a week to check, a, just to walk past a, a, a mink raft, or maybe half an hour a week or an hour a week to check a trap. But when you've got so many of them doing that for so long, the hours clock up and the effort means that we can cover areas we would never ever be able to reach with a uh, higher hand. So what are we learning? Where, do, where are we at? Well, American mink can be controlled on this sort of scale. You understand the biology of the animal, you understand how they reproduce and where they, they wish to reproduce effectively, and you target those areas to, to make your control more efficient. High dispersal really means that you've got to, to go large here. If you try and control on a very small or local scale, all that happens is you remove a few animals and a few more animals from next door move in. So we're, we're going large in order to, if you like, clear out some of these central areas and then protect the areas that we've cleared. And that's really important um, because otherwise, you know, you're going to be unwinnable and you'll never see a difference in the actual number of animals in certain areas. Mink. Like all species, the female are the more important. Um, and settled females are clearly more important because they're in the prime locations for breeding and they are the ones that generate the new, new offspring for us. So we know where these locations are and we can target them for our control. But removing the juvenile mink in the autumn is also helpful because there's large numbers of them moving around and we can also take out females who would be the reproductive animals of the following year. And those sort of tactics in combination allow us to bring the density of the population down and bring about some sort of control on this um, pretty voracious predator. So that is the story of our mink control in a very sort of potted um, 15 minutes or so um, sequence. Um, I've not been able to watch the questions. There may be questions now, but I'll just quickly come out of the screen and then um, we can see if there are any questions on this or any other part of the, the, the evening's performance. Oh, okay, there are two or three. Okay, how do you dispatch the mink when caught? Um, we, we dispatch the mink using an air pistol. Um, all the staff that do that are qualified to hold their, their certificates, and we try to do that as discreetly and humanely as possible. And that's a recommended approach, Andy, to that. Um, the animals are dispatched in the trap at the location that they're captured in. And then, um, you know, it's not a particularly pleasant part of the task, but it's a necessary part of the task. And we, we, 
we kind of make no great apologies for doing so. It's just part of the role, but I think it's it's better that we're just up front. It's a dispatch by air weapon to the head, and it's the recommended approach. Um, yeah, for farm releases, yep, that's certainly the past how they got about. There was they were escapes from fish from fur farms and also deliberate releases in the catchments. Uh, what else did we have here? Nothing too much on the mink front, Callum. I don't no, know. that's great. And normally, mink system. Yeah. Okay. I read that. Yeah. Otter. Yeah. That. That's. That's. That's true. Purchase. Um, otters and mink when they're in the same place. Often the otters will kind of make a little bit of a difference to the mink numbers. So often inhabiting the same areas, and otters are a, a larger animal, and tend to both the both the pairs be a little bit. Um. So yes, that can happen. And a question about insurance of air pistols. Um, generally, the dispatch is undertaken by staff um, and, and or qualified volunteers. I, all, all volunteers who are undertaking dispatch for us, and there are very few, um, are doing so with us having knowledge of the qualification and then being insured by their own employer. For example, if it's a ghillie or a, a bailiff or a, a, a gamekeeper. <laughs> Gamekeeper Pike, who are often involved in this with us because they do that in their line of work. Um, and if not, can we do have a small number of, of volunteers who do this batch? They would be covered, they are covered under the insurance of the individual fishery provision. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's clearly one of these sort of, uh, areas of the project that we're very conscious of the, 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 the public perception of, of getting that wrong and making mistakes and also it's not some, something that we want to do anything other than a professional or um, sensitive and, and discreet way. Okay, I think we've probably exhausted the mint questions. I'm also conscious that it's quarter past eight. Um, so I think if there are any other questions then do file them in very quickly um, and we'll do our best. Um, in the meantime, though, I think at quarter past eight, I would just like to thank everyone again for coming along this evening. I think I saw the number up there, 70 odd people tonight, which is fantastic. We're delighted to, uh, if not see you, then know that you're there. Um, we did wonder if the, the clock's changing, we'd have meant that you were all out running about in the in frolic in the sunshine. But thank you very much for taking an hour and a bit out your evening to, to join us. Um, we have been recording the session this evening and we'll make it available on the website. So do keep an eye out for it. Um, we in, in the CC project haven't got the name, rank and serial number of the attendees, but um, we'll certainly make sure it's made known um, on our social media platforms and with TCE Scotland. Um, so it just leaves me to say thank you very much to my colleagues this evening for giving up the evening, Mark and Karen, and for Trisha Burden, who's been hiding away in the background from PCB Scotland, um, but who's helped us greatly by putting this opportunity together. And um, I just want to say thank you very much, everyone, again, and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. And um, do let us know or get in touch if you'd like to get involved in the project, or um, you know, if there's anything that you've not felt you've got an answer to this evening, you can catch us um, via our website. There's contact details there, and we, the email address is monitored and responsive. I promise. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye.